as we go. Um, welcome to the first of our seven Lenten speaker series talks. The series is offered by the Brandywine Deanery of the Diocese of Wilmington. We hope to have many more joint projects with our six churches over the next three years. The Brandywine Deanery is made up of St. Joseph on the Brandywine, Immaculate Heart of Mary, St. Helena's Holy Child, Holy Rosary, and St. Mary Magdalene churches. Your deanery leadership team, made up of lay people and led by Father Carrier of Holy Child Church, has been working for the past year on a strategic plan for the deanery. That's why we had the surveys earlier. Um, I'm admitting people as I'm speaking, so I'm sorry to interrupt myself here. Uh, more information about the strategic plan will be coming after Easter, um, but each of the speakers in this series has agreed to speak for 40 to 45 minutes, then to allow 15 to 20 minutes for questions. All questions will be held to the end of the meeting. If you have a question, send it to brandywinedeanery at gmail.com. And deanery is spelled um, D-E-A-N as in Nancy, E-R-Y. And that's all one word, brandywinedeanery at gmail.com. I am excited to introduce our first distinguished speaker, Dr. Christopher Kazor is the Honorary Professor for the Renewal of Catholic Intellectual Life at the Word on Fire Institute. He is also Chair of the Department of Philosophy at Loyola Marymount University. He is the author of 16 books, including Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life. His, the, his research on issues of ethics philosophy and religion has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, National Review, National Public Radio, the BBC, EWTN, ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, MSNBC, and the Today Show. We are very grateful to Professor Kazor for sharing his story with us this evening. Professor Kazor. Thank you, Ellen. Appreciate it. So uh, welcome everybody, happy Fat Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow the fun really begins, right? We have Lent, Ash Wednesday starting tomorrow. So I'm happy to be talking with you today about um, this topic of happiness because Lent really is about happiness. I know that seems sort of counterintuitive, but the word Lent actually comes from uh, the word to grow. And the whole idea of Lent is that we're gonna grow, hopefully in our spiritual life will grow hopefully, in love for God and love for other people. And then as a result of that, hopefully, we are going to be uh, happier at the end of Lent because we're more filled with the love of God uh, than we are now. So happy Fat Tuesday, and I hope tomorrow, Ash Wednesday, is a great day for you. So let me start off, though, uh, hopefully by getting this um, screen shared properly. So it says, uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. So I can't share my screen yet. Okay, I'll have to figure that out again. Sorry about that. That's all right. There you go. Now I can. Nope, still not working. Maybe I can now. <laughs> now I can. Okay. Yeah. So let's. Uh, all right. Slideshow from the start. Father Kayser, you're going to have to let people in as they come in. Okay. I'm not a father. I mean, I am a, a biological. I'm sorry, not father, doc doctor, professor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I don't know how to let people in, so I don't know how that's going to work. So <laughs> anyway, I uh, want to start off just by letting you know that obviously I'll be talking today, but if anyone's interested in a written version of uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, it's available as a free uh, ebook on uh, with the website there that I just mentioned. So anybody who wants a kind of written version of this or to send it to someone else, maybe you couldn't make the talk, you feel free to uh, to get the free ebook that is available there on the on the screen. So let's talk about happiness. What exactly is uh, happiness? Well, this is universally acknowledged as the goal 
of human life. Aristotle, for example, said that happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim of human existence. And the great philosopher Blaise Pascal made the same point. Jesus, of course, prayed, Holy Father, I speak this in the world so that they may share my joy completely. So it's not just philosophers like Aristotle or Pascal, but also our Lord himself talks about uh, the desire for joy, the desire for happiness. Now, the big question, of course, is well, what exactly is happiness? And um, happiness, of course, can be defined in various ways. So when we talk about what happiness is, um, we can think about it in lots of different ways, but I want to start off really with the opposite of happiness. Um, I want to start off with a story from my own life. So this was about 15 years ago, and my family moved to Washington, D.C., and I loved it there. I thought it was fantastic. I made new friends. I was uh, the uh, head of the uh, honors program, and it just was a great time in my life. But unfortunately, my wife absolutely hated it. And so we kind of fought a lot about, well, should I, uh, should we stay in Washington, D.C.? Should we come back to L.A.? We went back and forth on this. And at the end of the day, um, you know, she just wasn't changing her mind at all. And so I thought, well, I want to try to move her to really love Washington so we can stay here. So I started praying a lot, asking God to, you know, change things and change her heart and this and that. And nothing happened. And so I got some of my friends to pray and we were, you know, I was doing Lenten sacrifices, hoping things would change. Nothing happened. So finally I went to her and I said, well, honey, you know, I'm praying a lot for you that you will uh, grow to love uh, living in Washington, D.C. And she said to me, well, that's very interesting. She said, have you asked God what God wants? I thought, no, I, <laughs> I haven't done that. So after a while, I thought, well, you know, God does know everything. And, uh, you know, maybe I should consult. Maybe I should check in. And then basically pretty soon I realized, you know, I thought, you know, God does want me to go back to uh, Los Angeles. So I came back and I'd like to say that when I got back to Los Angeles, I was in a great mood and I was very uh, chipper and upbeat. Uh, but that that isn't true. I was very upset and uh, and still feeling really sad. So what I did is, um, you know, what any scholar would do, I Googled how to become happier. And what I found was something called positive psychology. So what is positive psychology? Well, psychology for most of its history was focused on the negative. Things like anxiety, depression, bipolar, things like that. And in the year 2000, Martin Seligman of the University of Pennsylvania challenged the American Psychological Association, and asked that they focus not just on what's negative, but on what also what's positive. And so they began to do empirical research on what makes people happier, what leads to greater flourishing, what leads to people really thriving. And so this whole new field of empirical psychology was developed called positive psychology. So when I was so depressed and unhappy, I looked to this field to kind of figure out and gain some new understanding of things. And if we think of what happiness is, the positive psychology folks define it in terms of a number of characteristics. The first and sort of most obvious is positive emotion. Obviously, happiness has to do with being up, feeling good in terms of our emotions, feeling filled with optimism and zest and zeal and joy. People in positive psychology like Seligman also said there's more to happiness than just positive emotion. There's more to flourishing. So in addition to that, he talked about engagement. Now, what's engagement? Engagement is basically the feeling that you and I have had before, I'm sure, where time stands still. You're so involved in your activity that all you can think of is what you're doing. You know, playing golf, talking to a friend, going to a movie. You're totally involved in the moment. And that too is part of happiness for human beings. The third aspect of happiness for human beings is good relationships with friends, with family. That is really the heart of happiness is having these good, positive relationships. And then another aspect of happiness, according to positive psychology, is meaning. 
Now, what is meaning exactly? Well, they define meaning as making a difference for others. So you can think about Winston Churchill. You know, he made a huge difference for the world in fighting the Nazis during World War II. Or think about Abraham Lincoln. He made a huge difference for the United States by preserving the Union. Or think about a mom taking care of her baby, right? She's making a huge difference for that baby's life. So we find meaning through making a positive contribution to something larger than ourselves. And the final part of happiness that they talk about is achievement. And that's basically getting your goals, achieving your goals. So maybe you have a to-do list, uh, maybe you have career goals, maybe you have goals for the year. And the idea is that you are going to achieve uh, or you're going to have some happiness if you do your goals, if you achieve your goals. So we can summarize this psychological understanding of happiness in terms of PERMA, this acronym. So positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. And that is how in secular psychology, Martin Seligman, for example, would define what happiness is. Now, there are some thinkers that believe that Christianity is the opposite of happiness, that Christianity is going to undermine happiness. So I'm thinking here of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, and he thought that basically what Christianity will do is undermine human flourishing and happiness. And another example of this similar view is uh, Sigmund Freud. So he thought uh, when a man is freed of religion, he has a better chance to live a normal in wholesome life. So both of these views kind of said, you know, if you're a person of faith, especially Christianity, you're going to just undermine your own well-being, your own flourishing, your own happiness. But the interesting thing is, is that in positive psychology, they've actually studied what does and what does not lead to happiness. And they found some interesting things. First, what they found is that people who practice a religion, religious faith, on average, have higher degrees of positive emotion. So practicing a faith, going to church, being with others who are people of faith, actually enhances positive emotion rather than detracting from positive emotion. In fact, there was a study done of uh, fun versus altruistic activities. And this was at the University of Pennsylvania. And basically they said to undergraduates, well, to one group, we want you to do fun things. So go to the movies, Go, um, you know, go eat ice cream, do something fun. On the other hand, they had people, another group of students do altruistic activities. That is activities that really helped other people. So they would, uh, you know, tutor kids in uh, helping them learn how to read, things like that. And basically what they found is that both of these groups had greater positive emotion as a result of doing their activities. But here's a key difference. Those that did the altruistic activities were found to have longer lasting positive emotion. And this is really significant because, as you know, our Christian faith calls us to do works of mercy, to do the corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, giving drink to those that are thirsty, clothing the naked, and also spiritual works of mercy, like praying for those that are living and dead, like instructing people who don't know things, things like that. And so our faith, especially during Lent, calls us to almsgiving, to make a difference for other people. And the secular psychology indicates that this is a good way to augment our positive emotion. Another thing that they found was the importance of gratitude. So in one of Martin Seligman's studies, he found that people who express gratitude were able to lower their rates of depression very significantly. So the simple practice you could try today is at the end of today, just write down three things that you're thankful for that happened today. Could be a good conversation with a friend, maybe a meal that you enjoyed, maybe a nice walk that you had. But the basic idea is to thank uh, God for some good thing in your life. And this practice is something that, again, the secular psychologists have pointed to as something that really augments our happiness. This idea of gratitude is so central to Christianity. Um, as you may know, the uh, term Eucharist is the Greek word for Thanksgiving. So every Mass is a chance to give gratitude. Think about the very last words of every Mass, or what? Thanks be to God. That's the very last words that we say as Mass is ending. 
And so gratitude is a way of really enhancing our well-being. So this is something we could maybe practice this Lent to try to be more grateful in very concrete ways, grateful to God and also grateful to the people in our lives. Hopefully we all have friends and family that make a difference for us, you know, make meals for us or help us in this way or that way. And we can really augment our own happiness by recognizing that and celebrating that and being grateful for that. And then of course, to be grateful to God. And during Lent, it's a fantastic time to amplify that. So hopefully you'll go to Mass every Sunday, but Lent is a great time to go to Mass more than once a week, right? We can go to Mass maybe every Friday during Lent, or maybe even more often. But every Mass is a chance to be grateful. So every Mass we can think, okay, God, what am I grateful for now? You know, my health, my family, my friends, good things that have happened to me. Every Mass is a chance to offer that back to God. St. Ignatius Loyola recommended what he called the examine. And it's a practice that I do, and I recommend to you also. And it's a kind of prayer that you do every night. You think about your day. You think about whatever good things happen to you. You know, a good meal, a good conversation, some task that you were trying to get done that finally got done. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It could be a beautiful walk around the block. But the basic idea is to thank God for whatever is true and good and beautiful that's happening in your own life. So part of uh, happiness, according to the secular psychologists, is engagement. And that's part of happiness for people of faith, too. If you think about the story of Genesis, what does God do? God works, right? God creates things and works. If you think about Jesus, Jesus worked for 30 years in a kind of private way. And then he worked in a more public way at the end of his life. But we're all called to engagement. We're called to make the best use we can of whatever gifts we have. And each of us obviously has different gifts. And each of us is in a different circle. So I'm called especially to try to use whatever gifts I have to make my own family and my family and friends and those in my circle better off than they are as a result of my gifts. And that's the call of all of us. Now, the heart of forgiveness. I mean, the heart of happiness is relationships. And we can't really have good relationships without forgiveness. Now, why do I say that? Well, the fact is, since we're weak and uh, fallen people, we're going to do things and say things that hurt other people's feelings. And other people will do things and say things that hurt our feelings. And if we don't have forgiveness, what happens is we don't have any long-term relationships. So this is a fantastic thing that we can do during this Lent. You might have someone like I do, people in your life that have really hurt your feelings, people that have really harmed you in some way. This is very challenging, but we can try to take seriously the call of Jesus to forgive even our own enemies. So that doesn't mean that you have to, you know, call them up and say, hey, we're best friends again or something. It can be as simple as giving them basic human respect. And maybe if you're not in contact with them, to pray for them, to ask God somehow to bring good out of the evil that's been done. But if we can find forgiveness, we really will find freedom. Because unforgiveness is, is sort of like, uh, it's like having a, a bunch of garbage, right? That, that, that you have been, uh, that's been thrown at you and you've been collecting and you're carrying it around. And, you know, you're, you know, it's stinky, it's heavy. And forgiveness is letting it all go, or to use a different metaphor, unforgiveness is a little bit like having burning hot coals and getting ready to throw them in the face of the person that's harmed us. But what forgiveness is, is letting go of those coals, right? God is just, God is going to ultimately uh, vindicate justice. And so we don't need to do this ourselves. We don't need to take revenge, right? We can let that go, hopefully. And if we do that, we're really going to enhance our relationships with others. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the idea of making other people's lives better. Mother Teresa put, put it in the following way. She said, let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness, kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, kindness in your smile. So this Lent is a great opportunity really to enhance our relationships with others, maybe with husband or wife, maybe with son or daughter, maybe with brother or sister, neighbor, someone living down the street. But the basic idea is Maybe we can be a little bit like Mother Teresa to them, right? Being very kind, 
listening to what they have to say, being very helpful to them if we can, things like that. Now, a great way to help people is through a prayer of loving kindness. And this is basically a kind of prayer petition. So if you uh, don't do this already, maybe you do, but this is a great way to enhance uh, our love for other people is to simply pray for them. So you can start off praying for whoever is closest to you. Maybe your husband or your wife, maybe your kids, maybe uh, relatives, grandkids, and you pray by name for each person. And of course, people have different needs. So maybe one person's struggling with finding a job. Another person may be struggling with trying to find a husband or a wife. Everyone has their own issues and struggles they're dealing with. But the basic idea is to bring them to God, to pray for them. And the more we do this, the more we're really going to enhance our relationship with them. Now, there could be someone in your life that's a little bit like Darth Vader, right? I'm, I'm sure there probably is, right? We've all got people that are, you know, wow, really negative uh, toxic people, you might say, people that have been harmful to us. But one thing we can do is try to look for the good news in that person. And so imagine Darth Vader. What's good about Darth Vader? Well, obviously there's lots bad in Darth Vader, but what's good about him? Well, uh, he's good with a lightsaber, so that's, that's good. Uh, he's good with um, organizing the Death Star. Well, that's good. He also had the potential to turn good again. And that potential to repent, which he did at the end of his life, is something else that's good in him. So what we can do with whoever's in our life is we can look for the good news in them. We can look for whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, we can look at those things. And this leads, if we're really looking for the good, to appreciation. So when I was in D.C. having this big conflict with my wife, I remember being so upset with her. And I went before this picture of uh, that I'm showing you now, this picture of Jesus at the wedding at Cana. And it's a neat picture where the servants are pouring in the water and then it turns into wine when they pour it. And I think that's a, a beautiful image of what God wants for us. right? God wants to bless the ordinary water of our relationships and turn it into the rich wine of deeper love. And the way we can do this in part is through appreciation. So maybe if there's someone in your life that is, uh, you know, a Darth Vader to you, a toxic person to you, I might suggest this practice. You can go before the Blessed Sacrament with pen and paper and say to God, you know, God, I don't see much good at all in this person. This person drives me crazy. But you did make this person and you do love this person, and you, God, want this person to be in heaven forever with you. So please help me to really see whatever is good in this person. And you can write all about that, whatever is really good in that person. It might take you a while, but hopefully God will inspire you to really appreciate whatever good is really in that person. And if you can do that, then you're already loving that person. So what is meaning? Meaning, as I said before, is making a contribution to the well-being of others, making something outside of yourself better. And one of the great uh, insights of Christianity is that meaning is not reserved simply for presidents and prime ministers and popes and big shots. All of us can have greater meaning in our life. Anytime that you have contact with someone else, that is an opportunity to be kind to them, to be understanding to them, to make their life just a little bit better. And whenever we do that, we do increase our own meaning and therefore our own happiness. Finally, let me say a word about achievement. So we can distinguish between two different kinds of achievement. So comparative achievement would be being better than others. I'm richer than you are, I'm more powerful than you are, I'm more famous than you are, or whatever. On the other hand, non-competitive achievement isn't about comparing yourself to others. It's about doing the very best that you can, regardless of whether that's better or worse than others. So I would say that Christianity kind of warns us against comparative achievement, in part because that is a kind of never-ending cycle. So Michael Jackson's a great example of this. He was the greatest uh, musician of all time in terms of selling albums, and yet he never felt satisfied. He said, after Thriller, 
I spent the rest of my life trying to outdo Thriller. Much better and more wise is not trying to compare ourselves to others. Am I richer? Am I more powerful? Am I, you know, more handsome? Am I more whatever? But rather trying to do the best you can with your own gifts to do your own personal best rather than worry so much excessively about comparing yourself to others. Now, you might note that all the things I've talked about, positive, achieve, positive emotion, engagement, relationship, meaning, achievement, all that could be had with not without Christianity. Yes, it's true that Christian practice augments that, but you could be an atheist and still have positive emotion. You could be agnostic and still have good relationships, and that's true. But even though that is true, I don't think that positive psychology is really enough. For one thing, death destroys positive emotion, engagement, relationship, meaning, and achievement. And positive psychology really has no answer for the problem of death. Christianity does, though. Christianity has the answer of the resurrection. We hope for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Sin undermines PERMA, positive relationships, engagement, meaning, and achievement. And positive psychology doesn't really have an answer for sin and guilt. But sin and guilt are really a reality for everyone. Atheists feel sin and guilt. So do agnostics. But Christianity does have an answer for that, the forgiveness of sins. And that is one of the best things about being Catholic. Everybody does things that are wrong. That are wrong. Everybody feels guilty sometimes. But we as Catholics are so lucky because we can get rid of our guilt. We can get rid of our sins. We don't have to carry around the burden of, oh my gosh, I did this. Oh my gosh, I did that. And that's one of the great uh, benefits of being Catholic, that we can go to confession every Saturday in almost every Catholic church in the world is an opportunity for renewal, an opportunity to get rid of the garbage and the stinky uh, nature of our sins and put them away and start over again. So, you know, if you only do one thing this Lent, I would strongly encourage you to go to confession, to start over again, to give God your very best by starting over. No matter how long it's been, uh, my father-in-law was away from confession for 50 years, 50 years, and he came back. So whether it's been 50 years or it's only been, uh, you know, five months, now is the time. Lent is the time for confession, for renewal, for starting over again and cleansing yourself before God. One of the great benefits of Christian faith that positive psychology doesn't provide is divine providence. So many people say things like, well, this happened for a reason, but they don't really have a good reason for thinking that. We do. If God exists, then God has providence over our lives. And even the unpleasant things in our life ultimately are only permitted by God for our ultimate well-being. Positive psychology gives us a lot but it can't give us perfect truth, perfect goodness, and perfect love. And that is exactly what we ultimately desire as, as human beings. We all want to know the truth, but no human being can give us perfect truth. We all want perfect goodness, but all of us are divided, partly good and partly evil. And all of us want perfect love, but no human being can give that to us. It's God alone that can satisfy the human heart. And that's why St. Augustine said, you've made us for yourself, O Lord. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Now, from everything I said, what do you make of the reality that there are unhappy Christians? I've met them before. I'm sure you've met them before. Maybe last time you were at church, you looked around, there's a guy like this, totally unhappy. And yet, it seems from all appearances to be a Christian. So how do we make sense of that? Well, what I'd say is this. Um, part of what makes us happy is actually genetic. So just as some people are born quite healthy and don't get sick very often, and some people are born quite sickly and they're always having problems with their health, the same thing's true of happiness. Partly it's genetic. So this poor guy here, uh, you know, maybe he is born with genes that make him more pessimistic, more gloomy, more sad. That's just the way he was born. And if he weren't practicing his faith, he'd be even more unhappy than he is. 
So part of what can make one person seem less happy than another is genetics. And we see this even on the playground, right? I'm sure you've seen little kids. Some of them are very upbeat, very joyful. Other kids are kind of gloomy and kind of dour. It's just a matter of genetics. And whether you're a person of faith or not, you know, your genetics are going to influence you. The other thing is physical and psychological difficulties. Whether you're an atheist or a person of faith, you know, doesn't prevent you from having physical difficulties. If you're, you know, suffering a lot because you got a lot of, um, you know, migraine headaches or something, of course, you're going to be less happy than you otherwise would be. And maybe someone's suffering from psychological difficulties, right? They're really anxious. Well, they're going to be less happy. So Christianity doesn't inoculate you against these physical or psychological difficulties that can lead someone to be less happy than they otherwise would be. Another thing that leads to unhappiness is sin. Sin is undermining love. But love, loving relationships are really the heart of happiness. So all sin, all wrongdoing is a counterproductive to our happiness, since our happiness is consisting in love, loving God, loving other people, and loving ourselves. But of course, if someone is a, a person of faith and they still nevertheless sin, they're going to be less happy than they otherwise would be. Now, what can we do about sin? Well, Thomas Aquinas thought there were three different causes of sin. So one was ignorance. Some people do things wrong and they have no idea it's wrong. Another cause of sin, though, is malice. So that would be where you know it's wrong and you're just like, I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care. But the final reason that some people sin is weakness of will. And I guess for, I'm guessing for you people, when you sin, it's not ignorance. You don't do things like, oh, I had no idea being rude was, you know, wrong. And I'm guessing you don't do it because of malice. Like, I'm just mean and I don't care. I'm going to be as mean as I want. That's not probably you. But I'm guessing you're probably, like I am, often not doing the right thing because of weakness of will. So you kind of want to do the right thing. And then you get in the moment, you get in the situation and, oh, shoot, we're doing the wrong thing. So let's talk a little bit about weakness of uh, will and what to do to strengthen willpower. Lent is a fantastic time to do this, to strengthen our willpower. So we know that there are certain willpower drainers. So one of those is lack of proper sleep. So if you are up, you know, two in the morning and staying up super late, you're going to have less willpower than if you got a good night's sleep. Another thing is eating unhealthy food. If you eat healthy food, you'll have more willpower than if you eat a bunch of junk. Another thing is drinking alcohol. Alcohol depletes willpower at the time and later. Another thing is being very, very stressed out. That's also going to decrease willpower. So now some of these things we maybe can't avoid, but if you can uh, diminish these things, that will help strengthen your willpower. Another thing we can do is flee temptation. So we know that like if you're not trying to not eat cookies, like this girl, let's say she's trying not to eat cookies. If she's staring at the cookies, the cookies are right in front of her face. It's going to be much harder for her to resist the temptation. So if you have some sort of willpower, uh, you know, weakness, it's best to not have that thing around, right? Not be looking at it, not having it sitting around in front of you. So when that arises, we can put it out of our line of vision. We can flee from temptation. Another thing to know is that when we have a willpower challenge, we can what's called surf the urge. The basic idea here is something like this. Temptation, you can think of like a wave and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we might think, oh, it's going to last forever. But in fact, no temptation lasts forever. No temptation lasts forever. Just as no wave just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and never crashes. All waves, no matter how big they get, are going to crash. They're going to go away. So we need to keep this in mind whenever we're tempted. Because sometimes we might think, oh, the only way to get rid of this temptation is to give in. Nope. It will go away on its own if we don't give in. So we can think about uh, temptation a little bit like a white bear. So say I say to you, uh, don't think about a white bear. Okay, go ahead. Don't think about a white bear. Do it now. Well, I'm guessing, of course, you're thinking about white bears. So when we have a temptation, it's not going to work really to say, well, just don't think about it. Because if we don't think about white bears, then we're wondering, we're monitoring our mind. Are we thinking about white bears? And, and of course, if we're monitoring our mind for white bears, then we're thinking about it. 
So what should you do? Well, if a bear actually went into your campground, they advise you to not bite the bear and also not feed the bear. So biting the bear would be, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think about it, which will make you think about it. Feeding the bear is giving in. Now, if you feed a bear in the campground, you know what happens? The bear comes back the next day with mama bear and brother bear and the bear family. Now you got 10 bears, right? So feeding the bear is not a good long-term strategy. It's going to come back. It's going to bring more. It's going to make it worse for you. So if a bear wanders onto your campground, what do you do? You don't fight it. And also you don't feed it. And what happens is that bear is going to slowly, eventually walk away. So that is the strategy that we can adopt for more success in terms of willpower challenges. We should really aim for improvement rather than perfection. The fact is all of us are weak. We're all going to fail sometimes, but we should try to get better. We should try to move in that direction. And that is partly what the season of Lent is about. So I challenge you this Lent to try to make this Lent the very best you've ever had in your whole life. So what would that mean? Well, it might mean different things for different people, right? Lent involves really three elements. We have prayer, we have fasting, and we have almsgiving. So what would improvement in prayer mean? Well, it would depend on who you are. You might want to try to go to Mass more than once a week. That could be a real improvement. You might want to say the rosary every day. That could be a real improvement. You might want to spend time reading the Bible slowly, maybe for 15 minutes every day, and imagine yourself in the Gospels with Jesus and interacting with him. That could be a great way to improve your prayer. And so it will vary for each one of us. You can think about it a little bit like exercise. So exercise is essential for remaining healthy. And what prayer is, is spiritual exercise. It's absolutely essential for us to be spiritually healthy. Now, it doesn't matter so much exactly what form it takes. So again, with exercise, maybe some people like to walk, some people like to swim, some people like to ride a bike, that's fine. And likewise with prayer. But the key thing is to make sure every day to pray. So if you don't pray every day, wow, Lent is a great time to start that. 15 minutes alone with God every day. And again, whatever form that takes is up to you. Maybe the rosary, maybe reading the Bible slowly. Here's a great way to pray. Write a letter to God. I always get distracted in prayer. I sit down and I start, oh, I start thinking about lunch and things I have to do at work. Fair enough. But if I find if I write a letter to Jesus, I'm much less distracted. And you can just write a letter about what you're grateful for, what your plans are for that day, what you're worried about, what you're fearful of. You can even write things that are very personal that you would never, ever share with anyone else. And if you do that, great. Just write it out. And then when you're done with the letter, you can immediately rip it up into tiny pieces, flush it down the toilet so no one will ever see it. But to write a letter to God is a great time to be totally honest, totally candid, totally upfront with who you are and what's going on in your heart and in your life. It's a great way to pray. So prayer. Secondly, fasting. What does that mean? Well, fasting can take lots of different forms depending on the person. So one thing that a lot of people do is they give up drinking for Lent. So just from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday, no alcohol at all. It's a fantastic uh, way to grow in virtue during Lent. Other people do things like uh, during Lent fasting from social media. So they don't get on Facebook. They don't go on YouTube. They don't get on you know Instagram or whatever they're on. Another great thing to do during Lent. They can, another thing to do during Lent is to fast in terms of, for instance, say not using any butter on your bread all Lent, or not putting any salt on your food, all Lent. But the basic idea is to do something a little bit against the grain, a little bit depriving you of what you'd otherwise prefer. And so it's a little bit like lifting weights, where if you want to get strong, you want to get muscles, you got to lift some weights, you got to push yourself a little bit. And so Lent is a time for fasting, to push ourselves a little bit, to get stronger spiritually. So we have prayer, we have fasting, and finally, almsgiving. So what does that mean? Well, almsgiving could mean maybe instead of giving, uh, you know, $40 at church, I give $50 at church. Or maybe I volunteer to help at, you know, this charity or at that charity. Or maybe I give to a whole new charity that I haven't given before. 
Or maybe I tell my son or daughter, hey, I'm going to watch the grandchild for you on Tuesdays during Lent, Tuesday afternoon. That would be a beautiful thing, beautiful way to serve and help others. But the basic idea is with almsgiving is to uh, do some sort of charitable work, whether with your time or your treasure or your talent, to give of yourself in some way. And again, we're not aiming for perfection. We're aimed, aiming for improvement. We want to be better come Easter than we are uh, today. Now, even if we work really hard and we have a great Lent, and I hope all of you do, uh, we're never going to have perfect happiness. We're never going to have perfect happiness. And that is good news. Because if we think that we're ever going to have perfect happiness on earth, we're always going to be disappointed. We're always going to be downtrodden because no matter how much we try, we're never going to have perfect happiness. And we'll always be disappointed because our expectations are too high. So perfect happiness is reserved for heaven alone because only in heaven do we love God perfectly. Only in heaven do we love other people perfectly. And only in heaven do we love ourselves perfectly. So perfect happiness is reserved for the life to come. And that's good news because we don't need to have unrealistic expectations right now here below. So that concludes my discussion of uh, happiness. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you want a kind of written summary of the things that I talked about, you can get get it in this free ebook called How to Be Happy. It's uh, You can write down where it is there on the Word on Fire website. And uh, anyway, that uh, brings to conclusion my prepared remarks, but now I look forward to uh, hearing from everybody else and hopefully some good questions. Thank you. All right, so I don't know how we're going to field the questions, but maybe Ellen could uh, kick that off, or I'm not sure. Yes, I had to reclaim the host in order to be able to speak. Got it. So, that's, so there we go. Um, we have a question. Are there moments in your life where saying no or turning away from a request, behavior, activity, person, philosophy, or way of life has made you happier? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact. So uh, this is just for me personally, but um, I stopped drinking alcohol and I drank alcohol, you know, basically from a teenager till I was uh, 54 or so. And just the last few years, I kind of felt like God was calling me not to. And I was like, oh, gosh, I don't want to do that. Like, you know, I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't like going crazy. But I, you know, I like having a few beers. And I just kept on feeling like God wanted me to do this. And then, I don't know, finally, I just said, all right, I'm, I'm going to stop. And so I basically stopped on September 11th. And yeah, so it's been a number of months now. And I don't know, I'm, I'm really glad about it. I feel more healthy, sleeping better. Um, I still enjoy life. So for me, saying no to alcohol has been an uh, enhancement, you know, for me personally. Um, so I'm not telling anyone what to do. Obviously, it's your choice. It's your life, whether you drink every day or not at all. But for me, it's been really a big enhancement. Um, another question is about whether Sundays are in Lent, I think. Do you think it's better to maintain Lenten practices, for example, fasting on Sundays, or is a break okay and perhaps even beneficial? Yeah, I would say it's best to do it uh, from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday uh, with no break at all. But that's what I think is best. And obviously, that's between you and God. Um, so if you want to have Sundays off, then it's not the church doesn't demand that. But if you're asking my personal opinion, yeah, I think it's best to have Ash Wednesday all the way through to Easter. Okay. And we have one more question. Many surveys find that those who attend church are happier than those who don't. Do you know of any research clarifying if that is both true for people who are faking it till they make it and for true believers? Yeah. So the interesting thing about that research, which I have looked at, is that it actually doesn't differentiate or distinguish between so-called true believers on the one hand versus people that are just kind of going along with it on the other hand. Um, what seems to make a difference is actions. 
actions. Okay. And so if someone were a so-called true believer, but then every Sunday they just sit at home and watch football or whatever, um, they're not going to receive that benefit as much as someone who maybe is going to mass with their Catholic spouse and isn't yet a true believer, quote unquote. I mean, and also when you talk about being a true believer, as it were, it seems to me that that our feelings about faith are different from faith. So in other words, on some, for me personally, on some Sundays, I feel very connected. I feel very much like God exists. Some Sundays, some, some Sundays I don't. I don't feel that way at all. I'm like, wow, this just seems not very, doesn't feel very real to me. But the fact is I do have faith and it's shown because of my actions. So I think that we can make a mistake if we reduce faith to feelings, right? God isn't concerned so much about our feelings. Sometimes we have great feelings, sometimes we don't. Our feelings are are influenced by how we slept the night before, whether we ate something that upset our stomach the night before. All, there's a million things, whether it's sunny, not sunny. There's a million things that influence our feelings, and that's not under our control. But what God does want is for our actions to be loving actions, to be actions that honor him, to be actions that help our neighbor. And maybe we feel great, maybe we don't. That's not really the key thing. The real key thing, I think, is our actions. So I would encourage somebody you know, not even to worry. Oh, am I a quote unquote true believer? Well, who knows? You know, uh, it seems to me the more important question is, you know, are you, are you loving God? Are you loving other people? Are your actions, the kind of actions someone who is a quote unquote, a true believer would do? That seems like the key thing. How do you respond to someone who doesn't accept your request for forgiveness? Yeah, so that can definitely happen. And I guess if someone, if you ask someone to forgive you and they don't, uh, you know, then that is the reality for a while. And I, you know, people do sometimes change. And in fact, everyone changes. Everyone changes, right? There's no, uh, it's obviously physically true. There's no, just you're set forever like a stone. We all change physically and we all change emotionally and we all change morally. So yes, you're right. Sometimes people might say, this is it and you're whatever. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You know, I don't see that. I don't know the future. So I think all we can do if someone says that is to try to be our best selves to them, to pray for them, to try to, if we can, do whatever we can to make up for what happened. You know, who knows exactly if we can do that. Sometimes we can't do that. But we can always pray for them and we can always ask God to richly bless them. And, you know, that could might be the best we can do for a while. But, you know, I honestly don't think anyone is, until they're dead, the story is not over. You know, I talked about my person I know who hadn't gone to confession in 50 years. You know, you'd think, oh, he'll never come back because he was Catholic and then he left the church. He, uh, this is actually my father-in-law. So he's, he left the church, uh, gay relationships for, you know, years and years and years. And then when he was dying, my wife, you know, we said, well, should we try to get a priest to come in? And he was like, no, I don't need a priest. I'm fine. I'm not going to die. And the nurse was like, he's going to die in a week. So, you know, we knew he was going to die. And we said, or my wife said, well, how about a priest comes in, not for last rites, but just to pray with you, give you anointing of the sick. So he's like, okay, I guess I could do that. So the priest came in and gave him anointing of the sick heard his confession, gave him the last Holy Communion, and also gave him a crucifix. And the last picture we have of him is of him holding this crucifix. And the nurse told my wife he wouldn't let go of it. She'd have to wash his hands around it because he just was holding onto it. And then he died a few days later. So until someone's dead, don't count him out. Thank you very much. We don't have any more questions. Uh, I... Very much. Someone Sorry. Kathy is raising her hand. I don't know if you can. I can't see that. Hold on. Okay. Uh, Kathy, can you email me a question at brandywinedeanery at gmail.com? I'm not sure. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see. Kathy? Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Well, if you, you can ask if you want. I mean, you're here. Go ahead okay. and ask. I'm, I was going to ask you if you can go further into 
um, Ignatius examine. You had mentioned that think of the good things that happened to you. Is there anything else that's part of that to examine the subconscious that um, that that you can extend upon? Yes, yes, definitely. So basically what you do, uh, the full thing is, I didn't talk about every bit of it. The, the full thing is this, you would think about your day and basically kind of go through your day. So I actually write it down a little note. So, you know, up at six, you know, uh, walk to work, worked on this, worked on that, had lunch here, met so-and-so, met so-and-so. And so I go through my day, all the things that happened, basically, you know, the, the eight major things or whatever. And then the second part of it for St. Ignatius is you think about your emotional life. You might say, well, what was a positive? What was a negative? What was a consolation? What was a desolation? So like, say I go through a day and it's like, well, uh, I worked on this article and that was very positive. Had a meeting with this person and that was negative because they were mad at me. Uh, had lunch with uh, so-and-so and that was a good lunch. I enjoyed that. I walked home. I was freezing cold because the wind was blowing. I forgot my coat. So you kind of go through your day, kind of ups and downs of your day. And then the uh, next part, the third part, is you think about your day and think about, well, how could I improve? So maybe I, I think about my day and I say, well, you know, I worked on this article and I really kind of got distracted. In the middle of it, I was, you know, on social media and I just should have focused on just what I was doing. Or in the meeting with the person, you know, I kind of was a little bit impatient. And I should have just listened more and been more loving and kind to that person in that meeting. And so you sort of think about, well, what could I improve on? And then the very last part is think about your day and think about what you're grateful for. So say I, I was grateful I got up and I had a good night's sleep, so I felt good when I got up. And then I walked to work and it was a beautiful day. Sun was out. It was fantastic. And then I was grateful that I was able to work on this essay. And I was grateful that the lunch was so good. And so you think about whatever it is that you're grateful to God for. So the basic outline of it, and this is a great you know way to pray. You can start this for Lent. Is you again think about your day, you know the major events of your day, you know maybe there's six, seven, eight things that happen that are kind of you know I mean not earth shattering events like you know but but something you could talk about, and then you go over it again and think about how your emotions were that day, positive and negative, things that were ups and downs, constellations and desolations, and then. You go through your day again and think about how you might improve, do a little bit better job, loving God and loving other people and loving yourself. And the final thing is to think in gratitude about what gifts God gave you in that day. Again, good lunch, good time writing, good meeting with so-and-so, uh, or maybe the meeting was bad, but it didn't go as bad as it could have gone. You know, you can be grateful for that. But that's the idea of uh, the examine of St. Ignatius Loyola. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Professor Kazor. Um, that was a perfect, perfect opening to our Lent, and I really appreciate it. I will touch base with you via um, mobile in about five minutes, but I'm going to, um, unfortunately, with Zoom, there's no way to, you have to end it. Yeah, <laughs> so that's fine. That's you'll, fine. Be, you'll be God, but I'll, I'll call you. Um, next Wednesday. The rest of these talks are going to be on Wednesday nights. So next Wednesday, February 20th, huh, I'm missing something here, guys. Uh, I think we might have a typo in our, uh, our thing. I believe that next Wednesday is Leah Labresco Sargent. Um, she's, the name of her talk is, uh, now is a very acceptable time, and it's a guide to building Christian community where God has placed you now. So we hope to see all of you. Um, please, um, if you could give your names uh, and email addresses to uh, your representative, your um, deanery leadership team member from your church, uh, we'd appreciate that because we want to be able to invite you and remind you of the next ones. So thank you so much for coming. Steve's next week. I'm so sorry. Yes. The next one is Dr. Stephen Barr, uh, science and religion. He's a famous physicist who lives in our diocese and is a good friend. Uh, Professor Steve Barr will be talking about science and religion, the myth of conflict. 
and uh, he's a very good speaker and also a very funny guy. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.